Good afternoon, and welcome to Supply Chain Now Radio. We are broadcasting live today from the supply chain capital of the East Coast, Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Scott Luton. I'm your host for today's session. In our session today, we're going to be discussing omni-channel fulfillment in retail with a supply chain leader from REI, one of the world's most successful outdoor equipment suppliers. Our featured presenter today is Mr. Donovan True, Division Vice President of Supply Chain Integration at REI. More about Donovan in just a moment, but as always, we're glad to have you with us here today on Supply Chain Now Radio. So let's tackle our ground rules first. All attendees will be on mute as we're looking to optimize the audio experience. Now with that said, let's make it as interactive as possible. Please do submit your questions via the chat toolbar. Of course, we'll answer as many as we have time for at the conclusion of today's webinar. And finally, a PDF of today's presentation and the recording will be sent out in the next few days to each of our registrants. Okay, so let's take a minute to recognize our sponsors here on Supply Chain Now Radio. First off, special thanks to Sponsor Talent Stream, a recruiting and staffing firm that specializes in helping organizations find top talent in the engineering, the manufacturing, and the supply chain space. To learn more, visit them at talentstreamstaffing.com. And special thanks to our sponsor, Apex Atlanta, which has been serving the metro Atlanta community since 1964. For those of you new to Apex, it is the premier industry association dedicated to end-to-end -end supply chain management. And if we'd move just to that next slide there. So around the world, our organization serves over 45,000 members. Apex offers membership and professional development, a wide range of education opportunities, industry leading research and publications, and widely recognized professional certifications. To learn more, visit us at apexatlanta.org. All right, you're in good hands today. We've got a great guest. I want to share a little more information about Mr. Donovan True. Uh, Donovan serves as Division Vice President for Supply Chain Integration at REI, where he utilizes his 20 plus years of supply chain, transportation, inventory management, operations, and continuous process improvement experience. Prior to his current role, Donovan held positions such as VP Global Operations and Supply Chain and Senior Director of Process Excellence with large global enterprises. Academically, Donovan holds a BSBA degree in Transportation and Logistics and Marketing from The Ohio State University. He has also completed his MBA with the New England College of Business. And at REI, Donovan is very passionate about items such as inspiring a positive workplace culture, improving organizational collaboration. On a personal note, Donovan's family lives the outdoor lifestyle, where they enjoy spreading the vital message of environmental stewardship. They also actively volunteer with organizations such as the Boy Scouts of America. With no further ado, please welcome Mr. Donovan True. Thank you very much, Scott. I uh, appreciate the uh, kind intro. Um, so hopefully uh, everyone will get uh, some good info out of this uh, you know, conversation today. Um, I'm going to try to walk you through a little bit of our historical uh, omni-channel development, what we've done the last few years, kind of what we're doing in the future years, and ultimately kind of pull this together at the end to uh, talk a little bit about how we are continuing to dive into our retail organization and leverage retail to really harness the full uh, power of our omni-channel fulfillment. And so uh, as far as Q&A goes, I uh, have my chat bar kind of slid off to the side. So Scott will ask you to prompt me if a question comes up that I uh, don't see. It's covering up a little bit of my presentation. So I uh, just uh, want to be able to see my slides as I'm walking through them. Um, to open up a little bit, uh, I'm sitting up here in Seattle, Washington today. This is the home of uh, REI's corporate office. Uh, we're obviously a, a national organization with stores uh, across uh, most of the 50 states. Uh, are still heavily penetrated on the West Coast. Uh, lots of opportunity out on the East Coast. Uh, but REI as a whole, we're a different kind of company. So we really pride ourselves around uh, a life outdoors is a life well lived. And that's really our... Uh, kind of overall vision for our organization is to really create life-changing outdoor experiences for our members. So we're a co-op, so a different kind of company. Uh, we're a member-based organization. Uh, I believe we hit, we have millions of members, it's about 17 million right now, and you know approaching 20 uh, here in the next few years, hopefully. 
uh, you know, so with that being said, we, we really uh, work on behalf of, uh, you know, delivering, you know, great experiences to our member base. And, uh, but we're not just co-op exclusive, so it's not member exclusive. We are open to uh, non-members to shop inside of our stores uh, and online. The, um, you know, as a, you know, as a, as a overall for our organization, we're really focused on, uh, you know, a handful of kind of key things. It's around people, community, stewardship. Uh, and, you know, like I said, it's creating, you know, a, uh, uh, a lot of really creating access to the outdoors and, uh, you know, creating those life changing experiences that people can have in the outdoors. So uh, more and more are our, our, uh, differentiation strategies around experience experience for us and, and really critical today and a differentiation strategy experience for us is uh, uh, happens inside of our stores. Uh, uh, so we, you know, continue to, you know, obviously offer. I would say, you know, probably the world's best gear we carry the, um, you know, but we also offer uh, the ability to like train and uh, bring folks into the outdoors to our outdoor uh, programs, as well as uh, REI Adventures, which is more of a, uh, you know, like a, a fully booked, I would say, um, you know, travel agency type of situation where we we uh, create opportunity to get people in the outdoors and, uh, you know, and fully catered like uh, vacation and destination type of trips. And uh, that's been expanding rapidly as well. And it all uh, centers around, you know, our expertise and in, uh, in gear and uh, the outdoors. So uh, our profitability as a co-op, we, uh, um, you know, as I said, we're a member-based organization. So we donate nearly all of our profits back to our uh, co-op members. I think last year we donated about $175 million via dividends back to our co-op members who, that are cashed out either through, you know, leveraging that against future gear buys and or cashed out, you know, as a check that they can uh, deposit in their couch. The, uh, we also donate to non-for-profits and uh, some government agencies to help improve access to the outdoors and uh, stewardship projects. And then we retain obviously some funds to for capital uh, improvements and uh, you know just continue to enhance and grow our business. So definitely an interesting business model. We've got a very good passion here at REI for the uh, the mission that we're at. Like I said, which is uh, you know life outdoors is a life well lived and helping our members live that. So, anyways, I uh, will leave that at that. I, got, I think I've got a decent presentation here for you that uh, I kind of overviewed just a second ago, so I won't go through it again. But here's my opening uh, slide here. So Omni Channel fulfillment and grow. So our world, like a lot of other retailers, we're seeing growth almost exclusively driven uh, through digital. So, um, you know, unlike a lot of other retailers, we're holding our own as it relates to uh, retail comps year over year, which is a, you know, a great new story. Uh, and we see, you know, some growth opportunities still for REIs that relates to store expansion and things like that. So we're not looking at contracting or doing it. We're actually accelerating store growth right now. Um, you know, but omni-channel fulfillment is a huge uh, opportunity for us to, you know, continue to grow our business, continue to make sure retail stays relevant in how we serve our customers. And there's a, a lot of reasons around that. You know, it's customer experience by getting customers into stores where we truly have a differentiation aspect there. Uh, we've got, you know, highly qualified associates. I can consult with folks, uh, you know, when people shop our stores, they're generally not shopping through convenience buys. They're actually dreaming and scheming. So you see people looking at racks of backpacks and they're not actually looking at the backpacks as much as they're envisioning themselves using that backpack, like, you know, hiking the Wonderland Trail around Mulberry Air and things like that. And so there's a huge differentiation aspect for us on getting folks into the store because online buying, we're going to lose in the Amazon world. If people can completely self-educate and they have the capabilities to, you know, shop based on commodity buying where price and service, meaning speed of service, is uh, how they're ultimately going to make their choice. That is not an area that we feel like we're going to be overly successful in. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we uh, move forward because there's uh, there's a piece in there on how we prioritize our business and, uh, and where we're moving. So, you know, the next Omni channel is obviously improved customer experience. So I kind of walked through that a little bit, so I won't hash it too much more. On the on the uh, right side of my slide there, you'll see uh, just a little bit of a quad diagram there. And it, this is a little bit on how we approach our business at, at a high level. So the, and I'll kind of walk through each one of these. So, 
the CE there is customer experience. That's like the number one thing we're focused on, and that's not abnormal in today's world. You go to any conference, and everybody's talking about customer experience, customer experience, right? And uh, but customer experience to us is you know really how we connect with people to you know create those meaningful, life changing outdoor you know events, and and hopefully uh, you know create a lifetime membership with them. So uh, with us being a co op. We don't have to, we have an advantage to some extent that we aren't necessarily concerned about driving profitability on every exchange with our customer. We have a vision that focuses much more on uh, lifetime value. And uh, I think it puts us in a very good place to look at the relationship with our customer over a much longer lens. Uh, so that is that is a key primary piece. The next two that I have highlighted out there, the GM is gross margin. So. We definitely look at margin in our business. Uh, you know, a healthy business is generally has a growing or stable margin on it. You know, an unhealthy business, particularly in today's world, and you'll see a lot of retailers with it, but they start sinking because margins start going down because the only way they can attract customers is by slashing prices or running, you know, outlet stores and things like that. So while revenue may stay strong, margins shrink and uh, it becomes very uh, tough to run a uh, healthy business on uh, shrinking margins. So we do focus on margin. Um, the, the REV in the, the bottom left is revenue. Um, so we focus on revenue acquisition. And I think uh, in today's world, revenue acquisition is quite interesting because, you know, counter to, to margin, you know, in a lot of cases, if there's opportunity out there, you do not want to absolutely perfect it before you obtain that revenue. Uh, it is worth going forward in light of a good customer experience, obtain that revenue, and then learn through process improvement how to drive gross margin out of that revenue if you feel like there's opportunity there. Uh, and then the last uh, corner there is expense. Um, so expense is a, you know, it's a, it's a key piece of the business, but it's really the, I would say the, the least significant of the four up there that we focus on our business every day. Uh, you know, our focus is much more around being relevant while being mindful of, uh, you know, expenses and how those expenses can impact uh, our gross margin over time. So, you know, that's a, that's just a little bit of how we look at our business and our approach our business. And it helps us a little bit with some of the prioritization. But there's a few other lenses that we filter through as we uh, prioritize our work. So I'm going to walk you a little bit through some some history with uh, with REI and kind of how we started shifting towards leveraging our retail to help improve the customer experience. Uh, and whether that's, you know, through margin improvement, through, uh, uh, you know, the ability to leverage retail locations for proximity and, uh, and speed and fulfillment options. Uh, and also just driving customer into store where they can get that in-store experience. So uh, several years ago, we updated our, uh, our legacy uh, kind of OMS system to uh, Sterling order management system. That's an IBM tool. Uh, we've been happy with Sterling. Uh, I've worked very closely with IBM to uh, help uh, kind of build out the uh, backbone for how we uh, really do all of our order management uh, uh, processing. Uh, and I'm going to skip through some of these details because you guys can read the slides here. The, uh, but one of the key pieces to uh, our, uh, our movement to Sterling uh, is it really uh, enhanced our ability to do uh, uh, some movements around RSPU. And we've had RSPU out for years. So RSPU being, I'll try to stay away from the acronyms as much as I can, but RSPU is uh, retail store pickup. So a lot of different retailers are doing retail store pickup today. Uh, you know, it's a... Uh, it's a great tool to drive traffic into stores. It's also a great tool through Omnichannel, particularly if you're dealing with uh, larger items. And we do a lot of kind of abnormal items like car top boxes, bicycles, um, kayaks, canoes, uh, paddle boards, a lot of the water sports type of stuff where, you know, the cost and convenience of delivering that to a customer can be quite challenging, but, and it's also difficult to store a large breadth of assortment inside of a store just due to the uh, cubic capacity uh, that we have the capabilities to, you know, deliver those to store for no charge to a customer who can drive who can drive into the store and pick those up and we can help load them on their cars and stuff like that. So that's been going on for a number of years. We'll talk about that a little bit more here. Uh, in 2015, we uh, enabled customer order shipments from stores. So what we refer to as SIF, store inventory fulfillment. Um, this was a, uh, you know, a huge unlock for us to basically 
shadow or take a shadow off uh, through a uh, an omni-channel standpoint and a digital standpoint on inventory that was in our stores and make it available to everybody. Um, so there was a, there was a number of enhancement that went into place as it relates to uh, you know systemic capabilities, but uh, we also had to create a uh, and curate store uh, operational capabilities to pick back and ship uh, you know within specific thresholds. So in today's world, we uh, we've got a relatively well-oiled store store operations group that uh, uh, is enabled to basically pick SIF orders first in, first out, and do fulfillment within two hours of the uh, orders drop into the store. So, you know, there's some uh, criticality there on uh, the stores, you know, number one, having operating procedures in place, number two, having the ability to, um, you know, uh, actually pick through the volumes of orders that they're coming in because it can inundate the stores in some cases, which can impact uh, uh, the customer experience. And there's a lot of learnings in there as it relates to just, uh, you know, the customer's uh, experience with uh, order fulfillment rates. So uh, you can be challenged if uh, store inventory levels aren't uh, accurately maintained because, you know, you're, you're basically only as good sourcing as your inventory or as your inventory accuracy is. So, so if we sift an order to a store and the store is uncapable of fulfilling that, we've got some contingency plans in place. We'll bounce that to secondary store, third store. Uh, it'll ultimately try to fulfill out of the DC if it needs to before we end up canceling an order. So I'll talk a little bit about more about uh, ATP optimization and stuff like that in the uh, the next slide. Um, sourcing optimization. So there's been a, a you know a lot of work in the background on how we optimize sourcing. Uh, a lot of this is around um, our ability to you know, really drive uh, expense and uh, ERD, uh, meaning like uh, estimated arrival date and packaging uh, optimization. So we uh, opened a uh, third DC in 2016 in Goodyear, Arizona. It's uh, our flagship DC. It's one of the only uh, lead platinum certified facilities in the, in the country. I think it was the first lead platinum uh, certified facility in, uh, in the country of its size. So it's uh, fully energy net neutral, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, it's a uh, magnificent facility with some wonderful technology goods to person stations technologies in it but we we were able to actually start looking at um, advancing our sorting or our sourcing capabilities at that time to look at primary secondary tertiary dc you know shipment consolidation uh those type of things to not only uh provide a great customer experience but also optimize the expense and also optimize uh our ability to reduce you know our CO2 footprint through uh, you know things like order consolidation and stuff like that. So we ship out less boxes, put less overall mileage underneath our boxes, and we uh, measure that, and that comes out in our stewardship reports. That uh, is kind of uh, foundational to who we are as an organization. But you know a big piece of that upgrade uh, to Sterling 9.4 was it built the capabilities for idle asset. And idle asset is uh, somewhat of an internal term to REI, but it's a play off of store inventory fulfillment. And uh, what it does is it starts connecting us more end-to-end -end across the organization with our merchandising organization. And idle assets a capability for us to source goods beyond just normal transportation fulfillment optimization, but to start looking at margin optimization for the organization. And so that takes me to kind of the next piece here. Uh, in 2017, we started looking at markdown avoidance and uh, store, in, store inventory fulfillment rate shopping. So um, and so basically what we do with that is we, we have the capabilities now to look at uh, our uh, markdown strategies that are moving into play. So as we transition between seasons, as we uh, um, uh, identify inventory in our retail stores that have been returned to store. So since we, we operate a full omni-channel uh, returns uh, business, meaning extended online assortment, which gets purchased obviously digitally, may be delivered to a customer, has the capabilities of being returned in a retail store, those goods can be orphaned because they don't necessarily have dedicated floor space to be uh, presented inside the stores or displayed effectively. And in a lot of cases, you could have items like, uh, you know, a pair of Scarpa uh, mountaineering boots that may cost $800 if someone was going to go on a mountaineering trip and uh, they happen to be in, you know, southern Florida, they'll return to one of our Florida stores. And that is, uh, you know, a very expensive asset that 
in a lot of cases because of the size and complexity of it. The odds of it marrying up with a customer in the retail store are extremely low, and those uh, in the past, those items uh, died a slow death. And so what Idle Asset Capability has been enabled us to do is identify those assets and drive prioritization around sourcing of them. So instead of the next, basically the next, uh, assuming their first quality and all that type of stuff, they, were, you know, they returned into inventory as uh, basically new sellable inventory. We have the capability to identify that as, uh, in our order management system when the next order comes in for that item and we can prioritize the fulfillment of that item out of the store to help not only alleviate um, inventory, uh, I'll say inventory congestion and, uh, you know, non-assorted inventory from our stores. But we also have the ability to preserve the margin on that, which it would have eventually just erod eroded down to near nothing and or we would have had to ship that, you know, as an expense back to one of our distribution centers to likely get, you know, plugged back into inventory and picked and fulfilled at a different time. So we just directly fulfill those items. The other capability that's starting to come into place with Idle Asset is, is we have the ability to, uh, uh, and this is coming in with the Optimizer, which I'll talk about on the next page a little bit, but we're, we're gonna start having the ability to uh, leverage Markdown, uh, uh, basically markdowns in line to start prioritizing inventory fulfillment out of stores to produce margin. So I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, so just a few months ago, so I'm up on 2018 here, uh, we just launched BOPIS, uh, and BOPIS is our uh, buy online, pick up and store. Uh, so it's a it's a awesome capability for us that, you know, provides both speed and convenience uh, for our customers. So a lot of a lot of BOPIS is uh, uh, can be fueled through an RSPU conversion in some cases. So uh, meaning where uh, you know a, a customer ordered online to pick up in store, and traditionally we only had an RSPU capability on that, where we would pull from the DC and ship it to the store. Well, in today's case, you know a customer really won't see the difference on that if they order to pick up in store. We will always default to BOPIS to try to fulfill that order immediately. And so those boats, those kayaks, those things like that, we have the capability to providing immediate uh, service on. But BOPIS also plays a big role in two other areas. Number one, it provides shopping convenience uh, across a whole wide array of uh, you know, our uh, SKU assortment uh, to not only like reserve inventory, if you're like, let's just say it's Memorial weekend or, you know, coming up 4th of July weekend and you're going camping and you absolutely need something you want to run by the store on the way to your camping trip, you can be certain that it's reserved and ready to go in the store to come, go straight in and out. It's also playing a big role as it relates to how we look at servicing our customer during critical shopping periods, like um, holidays and things like that. So, uh, any of you that operate, uh, you know, an omni-channel supply chain know how uh, challenging it can be around, like, the Christmas time frame. You know, carrier capacity is tight. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the absolute necessity to have orders delivered, you know, prior to uh, December 25th is a uh, critical cutoff. You know, at certain point in times, you start running upgrades, you know, on shipments to ensure that you're going to have a high uh, uh, performance level as it relates to that. And then at some point in time, you ultimately stop taking orders online because you can no longer fulfill by Christmas, even if you're trying to do a uh, next day fulfillment. Capability. The uh, what BOPAS does is it allows us to curate a um, a uh, differentiated fulfillment strategy as we progress through the holidays. And you know, your last minute shoppers in a lot of cases can go online and actually, you know, curate a basket that they can pick up in store. And that could be, you know, Christmas Eve for. Uh, Christmas morning and that you know that's probably a lot like myself because I tend to procrastinate when it comes to shopping so uh, so that's some, that's some of the progression that we've gone through the last couple of years I'm going to take a few minutes and kind of walk through what's next because I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on inside of REI as it, as it relates to us uh, continuing to move to leverage our uh, our retail organization and uh, you know to drive uh, basically customer experience, customer experience enhancements in our in our uh, omnichannel world so the next thing up for us is uh, sourcing optimizers. This is uh, another IBM enhancement to the uh, order management system. What sourcing optimizer does is it basically gives us a number, a, a considerable amount of more dials to mess with as it relates to how we want to optimize our overall business. So there's, uh, you know, your uh, traditional, you know, 
delivery speed stuff. Um, there's some more sourcing tools as it relates to how we do routing selection. And I made a second bullet point there is auto region uh, uh, shipping reduction. Uh, and that's really how do we so how do we look at sourcing as it relates to ERD day to uh, you know source products as close as we possibly can from our customer, leveraging some of our capabilities that are in place like SIF, uh, store inventory fulfillment. And so what we've traditionally done is when we've taken a, a, a digital order in, we always looked at DC fulfillment. And then we'd go DC1, DC2, DC3. Then it would look at SIF, store inventory fulfillment, and then basically it would take a snapshot at full inventory around the nation. If we couldn't fulfill the order, it would cancel. And uh, you know, by far the majority of those orders uh, all fill. Um, there's really, it's only if there's a major inventory uh, dispute where we would end up canceling an order. But so what, what we're looking at with sourcing optimizer is to actually take a look at proximity more with our stores on how we fulfill to start driving speed, particularly as it relates to auto region inventory. And auto region can be driven through, we didn't have it in the local DC for a single item, or we didn't have it for a market basket, which we try to drive order consolidation as much as we can. And so we were, we were going to, we're starting to look at, hey, do we source from DC1, and then we're going to source from local store next. And what that does is it keeps us closer to our customer. And I'll talk a little bit about delivery speed and the importance of delivery speed towards the end i have a slide there but it's helping us as we kind of lead towards a uh, improved customer experience so you know the bar is you know through amazon prime is kind of set at that two to two day piece and uh you know obviously that continues to progress and we're we're well aware of that as as well as everybody else who operates in the space but we're kind of progressing towards a two to four day right now that's that's where our target is and you'll see some numbers on a slide here through customer insights that we've pulled on our behalf and obviously that continues to morph but ultimately we're on a path to try to work towards two day and our network today technically if ever if inventory was positioned perfectly across the network we can fulfill about 85 percent of our orders within uh two two days uh due to inventory positioning and the complexity of the SKU base we manage which is about 85,000 SKUs uh, we fulfill about 60% of those orders within two days. And uh, the main driving cause of us not fulfilling orders is out of, out of region uh, inventory. So sourcing optimizer and leveraging some of the local store inventory instead of just looking strictly out of the DC inventories is going to be a way for us to uh, actually source more of those out of region shipments closer to our customers to uh, help improve the speed of which we can deliver to the customers without you know, expediting orders. And because uh, that comes with a tremendous expense. So, uh, you know, and ultimately we've got opportunities to do same day capabilities and market and stuff like that, which, uh, you know, we've been looking at, but, you know, we have a little bit of a prioritization uh, lens that we look through that we've steered away from that. Or so we're looking at a little bit more of fixing the backside than we are on uh, advancing the front side at this point in time. Uh, you know, the other piece of sourcing optimizer is sourcing optimizer plugs directly into our. Uh, our POS system, our point of sale system in our stores. So we can see markdowns coming through our, uh, basically through our marketing and merchandising organization as we go through uh, inventory transitions between seasons and that type of stuff. And the markdowns typically post in our system uh, Sunday night. It gives the stores time to go out and uh, uh, basically re-tag items in the store or re uh, I'll call it planogram. We don't necessarily use that terminology inside of uh, REI, but you know, redo the layouts of the stores of those items if they're going to move them to clearance racks or if they're going to do special signage for them, that type of stuff. And typically, those markdowns will go into effect late that week. So, with the fact that we can punch into the uh, the POS system and see those uh, those specific markdowns in uh, inventory level at the uh, you know the item location level, we're start we're going to start having the ability to actually prioritize fulfillment. Uh, in advance of markdowns. And so a simple example is that is like, so a Patagonia like Nano, Nano Puff jacket, you know, very expensive jacket, All this, let's just say it's $300. When we see markdowns going as we go through the season, the first markdown we have is typically like 20%. So you're basically losing $60 of margin in that item, you know, the day it marks down, it looks to fulfill. So through sourcing optimizer, we're gonna see that stuff come. Uh, coming through the pipeline. And as we see inventory fulfillment coming, we're going to prioritize the fulfillment out of some of those retail stores of those items, you know, above and beyond just uh, uh, core transportation cost, you know, cost efficiency uh, uh, routing. So I may route an item that may cost me a couple dollars more to ship. 
And if I was running just purely in a transportation efficiency silo, which a lot of organizations do, uh, you know, they would continue to route that through, you know, peer delivery speed and or and, uh, you know, basically cost optimization. What we're looking at is a bigger lens on it. We're going to source that at it. We're going to pay a little bit more to, you know, send that that package like let's just say it cost me a dollar fifty more to ship it but i'm saving the the organization sixty dollars in margin because i was able to sell that out of the retail store before it went on a uh a clearance sale so some pretty exciting stuff there and it's uh millions and millions of dollars of opportunity there and it also allows us to you know if we do have overflow inventory we typically will sell it out of our stores without having to have transfer expense cost and we will maintain some of that carryover inventory between seasons in our DCs where it's much easier to manage from the standpoint if we're going to do buybacks, return to vendor, and or even store it for the next season. Uh, so our stores don't get burdened with, uh, you know, having to hang on to that inventory or clog up back rooms or return it to the DCs and that type of stuff. So uh, next piece around customer communication. And Scott, I'll try to pick up the pace here a little bit, but I think we're doing okay. Uh, if we uh, so we've got some enhancements around customer communication we're working on. I won't spend too much time on this, but it's really around you know the whole relevance around the importance of customer communication uh, as it relates to the uh, you know the omni-channel world. So our goal is to anticipate and answer any questions that a customer may, may have through the buying journey before they actually have to ask it to us. So you know, a customer places an order, we do instantaneous order confirm. Our goal is to speed up ship confirmations. Today we have a goal of 26 hours. Uh, we're actually trying to, hopefully, uh, over time, we'll get we'll even get quicker on that. Just to provide you know customers some feedback that their order has not only been received by REI, but it's been processed for shipment. You know, in between there, we're trying to develop uh, some more advanced uh, exception-based communications where uh, we have the ability to identify shipments that are, you know likely to deliver after the estimated arrival date and uh, in advance before failure, re-communicating with the customer on what the revised ERD date is and what the reason why. Uh, we're also looking to identify through different uh, transactions with our carriers on any items that may be highly probable, or there's a high probability that the item's damaged in transit and actually pull that item back, either back into REI or back to our vendors prior to delivering it and uh, hopefully initiating another order and communicating that, to, communicating that to the customer prior to the delivery. And so damages and things like that can be a little bit challenging when you're related to like boats and, you know, potentially bikes, uh, definitely paddle boards, uh, but it could be on, you know, any any item that's, you know, moving through a uh, uh, one of our 3PL networks that, uh, you know, there was something compromised with the order that we could take a look at. That's all about just, you know, preserving that customer experience and making sure we've got clarity on what's moving through. And the last piece is, is instantaneous delivery confirmation. So when an order actually delivers to the customer that we provide an instantaneous feedback that the order delivered. And this is all will hopefully be curated through uh, customer choice and communication, whether that's, uh, you know, an email, it's, uh, you know, logging into the web, it's SMS uh, communication. Uh, so we're working through some of the details on that right now. And they are, each one of these have a little bit different path on whether it's a, like a SIF order fulfillment, a BOPIS order fulfillment, an RSPU order fulfillment, a, uh, a uh, digital order fulfillment out of our DCs. There's similar paths, but there's some uh, nuances to each one of them that are very important to, uh, you know, nail down. Um, ATP optimization. So I touched on this a little bit in the last slide. This is a really big deal, and this goes back to the inventory uh, availability and uh, really being able to improve the customer fulfillment experience. So as you source goods out of a store, particularly as it relates to anything that's going to be picked up, so your items that are uh, you know going through a BOPIS fulfillment, um, or an item that uh, may be a, uh, an RSPU fulfillment that really to have any level of relevance around fulfillment speed must be fulfilled out of the local DC uh, to, to get to that local store for customer pickup. Uh, you know, the ability to have extremely accurate inventory information is what allows you to have confidence on shining the light across all the inventory you have available. You know, and as you move away from single single unit availability, you significantly reduce the amount of inventory that you can make available to your entire customer base. So there's a few pieces in here we've been looking at. We manage uh, threshold manually today. 
and we toggle it based on different inventory periods uh, uh, all the way down to single item and then there's some other you know there's there's times where we'll start right back and that out based on uh, some level of confidence on in-store uh, ability we also manage it a little bit during event periods different and that's uh, kind of a uh, I would say an ongoing learning for us uh, to protect both the customer experience in store while still curating a uh, environment online where customers can reserve and, uh, and pick up inventory and where I say that comes into play. So let's say we run, you know, I'll just, I'll use the nano puff jacket for an example, just to stay consistent. Uh, you know, we have an ad for like our anniversary sale, which we just uh, completed kind of through the Memorial, Memorial weekend uh, holiday period. And we, you know, say place 10 nano puff jackets in every single store on every single size. You know, this is a fictitious example, but somewhat like close to real. Um, if we make all those available and those are advertised, we have customers that are driving into the store to actually buy those items. But if we, we highlight them all online, there's a, there's a high probability a lot of those items will either be purchased, you know, through, uh, through BOPIS, so, so the reserved inventory. So the online, the online customer cannibalizes that inventory before the uh, customer that's actually driving into the store has the ability to buy it. So and it, it, it creates the environment where potentially we could have negative customer experiences. So we're looking at toggling threshold on some of those to actually increase reserve uh, to really preserve that in-store customer experience. So we may take item threshold from single up to seven, up to, you know, five, and it really depends on the item and what the velocity expectations are, and we get to continue to play with that. But this is a, uh, a big area where, uh, you know, we believe that there's uh, some machine learning opportunities here, and really what it is, it's uh, an, a store, kind of an item low level confidence interval based on fulfillment history, at locations uh, where you could more in an automated fashion set ATP threshold to optimize fulfillment at whatever percentage you felt like was necessary to run your business. So if you wanted a 95% confidence interval, statistically you could run that based on past fulfillment history on certain uh, you know item specifications. So we've met with uh, Onera who's a team that works on ATP threshold optimization and has some interest in continuing to partner with them as it relates to uh, how do we get more scientific around setting these levels at the item local level to you know, uh, basically set uh, fulfillment expectations or targets across our stores. I, we think there's some uh, pretty interesting uh, opportunities on the backside of that because obviously whatever that uh, uh, you know, whatever those uh, numbers come back with at the store levels, if we see, you know, individual stores or individual items that have higher uh, uh, thresholds set, you know, it's really driven to the fact that we are not confident in the ability to manage inventory on those items in the location. So it could drive some process improvement inside of our stores as well uh, as it relates to just uh, inventory management practices that we think our store, uh, our store operations teams could use that could ultimately benefit REI from both the, uh, you know, a shrink and a customer experience standpoint. So um, next thing is uh, uh, self-service return. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but REI has like a world-class return policy. However, we do not have a world-class customer experience for the digital customer on return. So the majority of our customer return, our digital customer returns actually return in store. And uh, it's a good thing. And uh, it's also a little bit of a bad thing because we steer our customers because of the fact we don't have a great uh, returns experience. So we are looking at basically building out a uh, returns experience sometime in the future. It's not necessarily uh, uh, on the... I wouldn't say it's like prioritizing in flight right now. We're in the process of actually building a leadership alignment around this. But uh, the ultimate target is is to create a uh, returns experience where we uh, separate the physical good movement from the um, the financial impacts on the customer, and we have basically the capability to like. For a customer to uh, identify they have return, log in online, identify the item they want to return, we forward them a label uh, to return it. And we ask them a quick question if it's you know uh, basically new or uh, you know been used. We'll drive some of our routing uh, capabilities on it. As soon as we see that label has a uh, ship confirmation against it, meaning that it uh, is confirmed, picked up by our carrier, we hope to uh, separate 
uh, that package from the customer uh, from the standpoint of like we will refund the customer immediately upon uh, shipment pickup confirmation. And then it's really just up to us to, uh, you know, reposition that inventory inside our network where it's most efficient. And there'll obviously be a little bit of uh, checks and balances on the backside where we'll just validate that what we got back is what the customer actually said that they were shipping and what we re, uh, refunded the customer on. And so that's really kind of the neat part of it comes in. So we're looking at a complete reverse uh, optimization engine on the backside for returns where we actually will potentially use digital returns as a retail fulfillment mechanism. So, in, you know, in, in the traditional world and how we operate today, a return would be uh, sent back to basically one of our DCs and, you know, be processed and put back into inventory. And the only way that item will ever move out of REI again is if someone places an order for it, we go back into inventory, pick that order, fulfill it, send it to a customer. So due to both proximity and the fact that we've got a heavy overlap between uh, our retail store base and, uh, you know, our DC uh, store base, when returns come into, into play, we're going, our, our future state, we're going to be looking at, uh, basically closest store, uh, inventory threshold, you know, uh, basically where the inventory position is on that item in the store, assuming it's sorted for it and with, based on where it's tar the target inventory level for that store is. If there's a demand for that item at the store, uh, we will route that item to the closest store to basically be restocked at the store. Uh, you know, damaged items, there's a little bit more uh, uh, thought that's going to go into that, a uh, bunch of different options there. And then there's some items that are highly probable that they're gonna be marked to require packaging changes and things like that. So when we ship out heavier items like uh, uh, bike racks and things like that, which generally don't ship out over box, they ship, in the, they ship in the OEM boxes. We are looking at potentially routing those back to some of our vendors. Obviously those uh, need to be all contracted and worked out for, uh, for a credit so they can be uh, reboxed and basically redistributed to us in our next order. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, we'll move through that here over the course of the next year, but some pretty exciting stuff there that I uh, really, the goal behind that whole thing is to create customer uh, convenience, you know, uh, move, basically advance the customer, their money back instantaneously upon processing a return. Uh, and really drive customer confidence in the shopping experience so they can not only buy online, they can also back out of a, uh, you know, a purchase in good faith quickly and seamlessly to hopefully, you know, improve the frequency of purchase and behavior with our customers over time. So, and then the last thing that we're looking at here, and I don't have these necessarily in order, is vendor, vendor inventory fulfillment. So uh, I'm sure there's a lot of companies out there doing this. We're starting to dabble in it right now. You know, tons of opportunity with vendor inventory fulfillment. You really need to have a good strategy on how you're gonna use it, because it is a, uh, a little bit of the wild, wild west, but, uh, you know, like a lot of organizations, we're looking at vendor inventory fulfillment to expand assortment, particularly in range, uh, color and size assortment on uh, on SKUs that we carry today. So, you know, you may carry the, you know, whatever, the red, black, and, you know, white, and uh, but uh, we may come into like St. Patrick's Day and want to carry the grain or, you know, things like that, where we can expand that and then really test and learn. Uh, some of it's product testing on uh, kind of new and in innovative gear. Uh, we can really, you know, see, hey, uh, you know, will this work? We don't have room in our shelves, you know, but we can make it available online. We may not have room in our DCs or we'll not want to bring it in, but we can fulfill it to the vendor. There's a big piece on the search engine optimization as well in here, you know, extending assortment uh, uh, creates a capability for you to have a larger, you know, offering in a category. Uh, also, if anybody searches specifically for items, you know, you have the opportunity to get pulled pulled up in that and uh, obviously driving traffic to your website's a big deal on ultimately uh, curating uh, demand. And then the last piece is upside sales uh, capture. And I think this is actually a really uh, interesting piece of VIF. And to me, one of the more interesting pieces, and I'm sure the merchants have a different view, but you know, every time we make a buy, we generally, particularly for our seasonal goods and things like that, that have to be curated, you know, quite far in advance. Uh, we, you know, buy X based on a forecast of X, and then we sell. If we sell it all, hey, awesome. If we sell a little bit of less, you know, we work on, uh, you know, moving moving the rest of those goods through or storing them. But when it, whenever you sell it all, you never fully know what the upside sales, you know, capabilities are. And uh, VIF 
assuming you're in, it's an inline SKU or things like that, or your, your uh, vendor has the capability of holding some level of inventory for you. When you actually sell out of all your inventory, VIF could be a backup to actually capture some of the upside sales potential on those orders and really help you learn into where some of those opportunities are and, uh, and ultimately drive forecast accuracy over time. So some interesting stuff there. So I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap up here just a little bit, and I've got uh, just a couple points I want to run you through, and then I'm going to uh, just pull up a couple customer insights slide. But, you know, so this last slide, you know, unlocking retail fulfillment of digital demand. So I talked in the middle about digital growth, omni-channel fulfillment, improved customer experience, and ultimately how is it driving retail growth. So hopefully I can pull this together for you. So with BOPIS and RSPU and omni-channel returns, Basically, what we're doing in a lot of cases is we're driving retail traffic and customer convenience, you know, through those fulfillment methods. Uh, today, 80 plus percent of our digital returns happen in store. Now, we may take that down a little bit um, with uh, rolling out a uh, more advanced uh, customer friendly returns process. But we're trying to shape that in place so we don't overly impact our in-trade customer experience. What we're really targeting is our out-of-trade customer experience with that uh, that uh, omni-channel returns or with the uh, excuse me enhancing our returns process uh, because we feel like our in-trade customers have a uh, a relatively decent option today and it, it, like it'll it'll be enhanced but we feel like there's a pretty decent option there right now. We see a, a very good. Uh, I'll say uh, consistency around our uh, in-trade uh, customers. Um, the second bullet point, this is an interesting one. So approximately 24% of our digital demand is fulfilled via in-store pickup. So what does that mean? That means there's we're driving a tremendous amount of traffic inside of our stores uh, that is curated to the digital footprint. Uh, it also is an expensive avoidance piece. So every roughly percentage point of digital demand we shift over to retail fulfillment saves approximately $600,000 a year in uh, operating expenses, mostly due to uh, transportation costs uh, and packaging costs for delivering to customers. This also um, you know, can be viewed, depending on how you look at the lens of it, as a little bit more of a green uh, uh, pickup opportunity, particularly for our metropolitan uh, customers. Uh, digitally curated traffic drives quantif a quantifiable rate of attachment sales for sure. So this is kind of the interesting piece. So if we fulfill 24% of our digital demand through in-store pickup, every single person that walks through those front doors, we have quantified approximately a $38 attachment upside sale to that traffic coming through the doors. So it's driving a tremendous amount of additional revenue on top of the items that were either picked up through RSPU, picked up through BOPIS, customers are in there picking up other items and you know in a in a digital delivered world that potentially wouldn't take place wouldn't take place at all and there's a high probability it wouldn't have taken place at rei so that traffic is such a huge piece and not only connecting customers to the aura and the experience of rei that's in our store that's driving a quantifiable increase in our uh, in our revenue uh, you know, and I kind of hit on that last point, you know, the, uh, the retail experience is, is critical to the differentiation strategy for REI. So a little bit on SIF, uh, so store inventory fulfillment, you know, that really is uh, about improving the customer experience right now, speed. It's also about revenue uh, from the standpoint as we, uh, um, you know, shine a light on uh, more inventory across the entire spectrum of REI's global inventory. Uh, and it's also about margin, how I talked about an idle asset there a little bit, and how we uh, help uh, I both identify, um, you know, items that are uh, in locations where they're, it's highly probable that they're not going to sell and uh, ultimately uh, erode the value of those goods over time. It also is a uh, great thing for uh, store operations because it keeps our, uh, our back rooms uh, clear and uncongested and allows the stores to operate more efficiently over time. So a couple bullet points on there, uh, really the speed piece and uh, a little bit of uh, some of the cost uh, piece is around auto region avoidance, you know, so proximity to customer like improves, improves our speed of delivery at a reduced rate because we're shipping, we're basically shipping closer to closer to where our, uh, our customer uh, are expected to be delivered from. Um, there's a big piece in here on, uh, on revenue as well. And I got a slide in here in a second. So we do a lot of work with customer insights at REI. And so we uh, have, you know, and you can see this through, you know, if you read case studies on Commerce Hub or, or you know, any, uh, any of the, the big players in this area, you know, they'll say like, you know, for every, uh, you know, like day of 
delivery speed that you pick up. You'll pick up, I think Commerce Sub actually has a, uh, a, a white paper out on this. For every day of delivery speed you pick up, you'll pick up about 4% increase in uh, uh, revenue generation, uh, you know, for your, uh, basically your digital delivery. And so we see that in REI, and we've actually proven some pretty interesting uh, numbers on it, which I've set up, up in a second. But delivery speed does effectively increase purchase frequency and increase average order value, you know, which are put those two together, and you've got some pretty uh, uh, powerful multiplication on what it can do for uh, driving uh, revenue for the organization. You know, and the last piece on, on uh, I, I kind of hit on the highlight is, is uh, margin factor in the routing decisions to maximize profitability, and that's really on that idle asset piece, and that's been a, uh, a great movement for us. And with sourcing optimizers I talked about in the uh, previous slide, which we're working on implementing now, which is going to be tied into our, uh, our POS system directly, we're also going to be looking at you know, advancing uh, routing decisions based on pending markdown uh, markdowns in flight. So we're, we're very excited about that. So last piece I had a note on here is uh, ATP threshold. You know, at the end of the day, to have a great customer experience, uh, particularly uh, leveraging your retail location, it is all about uh, inventory accuracy. And if we can improve, you know, BOPIS and SIF order fill rates through, you know, improved ATP threshold management and having higher levels of confidence on uh, our inventory accuracy in the location, the less orders that will end up uh, canceling and or having to shift the uh, customer experience on. So I think that's a wrap for me right now. Um, I'm going to hit this last slide real quick and then we'll jump into some Q&A. So, this was done by one of our uh, analysts inside uh, REI, uh, just an absolutely wonderful talent. But what we did is, we, we, this is a little bit of uh, customer insights through, and I wouldn't say it's not as predictive as it is a little bit of a batch mentality where we took a snapshot of about six months worth of data recently and then applied uh, you know, some, uh, some basically some analytics and reporting to it to look at uh, order frequency and AOV behavior between um, basically different uh, customer delivery experiences. So, you know, the green is same, or the blue is same day, the green is customers that are experiencing one to two day delivery, the, the yellow is three to four day delivery, and the five, which we marked as a relevant, five plus is, uh, you know, what we consider irrelevant. And so what you're seeing in there, these little dots that are sliding over, is that if we can take the irrelevant customers that are experiencing five plus into three to four day, you know, we're gonna pick up Basically, uh, and this is looked at as both in trade and out of trade, we'll pick up about $30 million of additional revenue. If we can move the customers that are in the, uh, you know, the three to four day into the one to two day, you know, we're talking about a hundred and, you know, call it $70 million worth of uh, additional revenue. So as we look at this and we continue to migrate our business closer to the one to two day, you know, we believe that there's $200 million of additional upside sales, and that's a, that's a pretty big deal for a, uh, a digital organization that has a revenue of approximately $500 million right now. You know, so just some tremendous growth opportunity out there for the organization to look forward to, and I think we've got a pretty good uh, handle on uh, how we're going to start migrating the organization to actually make this experience a reality for our customers here over the next uh, year or two. So that is a, uh, a wrap for me. I do uh, appreciate the time. It's kind of interesting talking into your computer and not seeing the audience, but uh, <laughs> I uh, hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> Great. So I'll open of, it up for Q&A. Thank yeah. you, Donovan. Really appreciate that. We've got uh, to, to our audience, uh, we've got several questions already teed up, but um, if you would like to submit a question uh, in the last few minutes here, please use your chat par, uh, your, your, uh, the chat bar and submit your question or observation. We'll pose that to Donovan. So Donovan, first question that I want to pose to you, uh, clearly you're driving a lot of change, a lot of initiatives in, in a fast moving industry that, that takes solid, a solid approach to leadership. So t tell us more about the makeup and, and the philosophy of your leadership style. Sure. Um, I, I'd say a couple things there. Uh, number one is, you kind of the basics around lean leadership, you know, uh, leveraging the hearts and the minds of the people around you, not dropping or dissolutioning, but helping to guide guide the team in the direction where the business needs to go. Uh, heavily based on, I would say, scientific information. So we, uh, you know, I think we're all smart people, and sometimes we uh, jump into the fact that we 
feel like we know everything and know where we know where we need to go. But uh, you know, it is. Uh, I have found in my career you can get corrected a lot of cases based on you know, based on your assumption and what the actual facts show you. So, leveraging scientific information and in our case, a lot of it's uh, customer insights and things like that to help either validate and or drive a path forward is uh, critical to. Uh, making sure you're applying your non-infinite resources in the most beneficial way possible. Um, the uh, I would say a little bit else about just kind of leadership and how we run our business is we uh, really look at leveraging our people here. So we don't have a huge team, but I've got some very intelligent folks here. Uh, we really look at managing our team as both uh, process improvement and kind of project and program management. And we leverage our 3PL relationships more and more for the day-to-day -day execution within uh, specific, uh, I would say, operating boundaries. Um, you know, and we also lean into our 3PL relationships a lot to provide us with relevance in the marketplace. Like, what are other people doing? What are you seeing? How are we operating? You know, what can we do better? Uh, and really kind of, you know, getting outside of the box because, you know, we're only so smart as, a, as an organization and as a team and uh, relevance in the world with the pace of change that's going on is, uh, you know, moving in a lot of cases faster than uh, organizational intelligence works just inside your own uh, four walls. So, you know, staying open and, and up to date on where you're going, but also have a, you know, clarity on what you're focused on and what your mission is and how you're trying to service your customers. So I'd say that's how we lead our work. Yeah. Appreciate that insight, and, and you mentioned the rate of change, and, and that's only accelerating in today's environment. So let's talk a second about uh, in this digital landscape, in this in this uh, rapidly changing environment, how do y'all constantly prioritize what's next from a supply chain initiative standpoint? Sure. So um, you know, there's a you know, I can answer that a couple of different ways, but I, I would tell you this: we put a recent change on how we look at running our supply chain uh, and, uh, you know, just from a, a lens on, you know, of all these awesome initiatives that are out there. And it's really easy to get kind of caught up in the shiny next thing like, hey, you know, could we do same day delivery? Well, absolutely. I've got a, I've got SIF order capabilities in place. I got a store operations uh, team that is like fulfilling 95 percent of our orders within two hours of drop into the stores. You know, we've got the technological capabilities to, uh, um, with, through ProShip to do rate and date shop at the store level. I could create courier relationships very quickly where we could do the same day uh, pick up out of the stores and delivery within market. But we're not going down that path. And the, and the part of the reason is, is we've created a lens on our organization. And part of it's looking through those, you know, like that customer, that speed of fulfillment stuff that we're looking at is we are very interested because we're a lifetime value organization. And because of the fact we don't feel like we necessarily win by being the cheapest, the fastest, all that stuff. I mean, we're a, we're a values-based organization. I'm getting, you know, life outdoors is a life well lived. We're all people community. We're about stewardship. And that's why a lot of our members buy from us. So what we actually focus on is eliminating the irrelevant customer experiences right now, more so than we focus on the next shiny thing. And so my focus as an organization right now is like killing the backside of all those irrelevant customer experiences. So customer deliveries that are over five days, and then we'll continue to move into four into three. But I want to kill those poor customer experiences where we start seeing erosion in that lifetime value. You know, there's a, there's a certain piece where, you know, you get a customer buying from Amazon, you get a customer buying from REI. Heck, I do both. Probably everybody does. The... Um, you know, where if we become so irrelevant from a two-day model that all of a sudden the value REI provides, whether that's a lifestyle value, whether it's the gear you care about, all of a sudden you can start making different decisions. And we see through customer insights where some of those, uh, where basically the exponential factor starts coming into play. And so we're driving more and more of our lens through eliminating, uh, or more and more of our prioritization through eliminating uh, failing customer experiences at this point. Terrific. One last question for you. So uh, clearly you've got an uh, incredible supply chain team supporting a lot of these efforts. How do you uh, develop your supply chain team? How do you ensure that they continue to grow their capacity and their capabilities? Yeah. So um, 
couple ways. Number one is, you know, we try to recruit great talent and uh, uh, we spend a lot of time with the folks once we get them in house because supply chain is exactly what its name is, right? It's a chain of synchronized events that have to take place to ultimately fulfill uh, a customer expectation and hopefully at the total lowest cost of the business. Um, so we put folks through, you know, uh, I would say a, a, a well thought out job rotation over time. So we'll take our analysts and we try to shift them, um, you know, into different roles so they get, you know, active and direct experience managing different areas of the business. And one of our analysts recently, you know, went for better operations and moved into managing uh, uh, inbound freight, freight flows, both into, into our DCs and direct to store. Uh, and then moved into uh, some of the omni-channel space where she was doing uh, uh, threshold management and um, kind of uh, uh, analytics as it relates to uh, measuring and optimizing uh, BOPA's fulfillment rates. And so moving folks through and getting them those different experiences, you know, our number one keeps them fresh. It also helps them, uh, you know, get a better understanding of how all these pieces of supply chain play together. Uh, you know, we also try to make space for people to learn and whether that is, you know, different trainings and stuff that we do, if it's time to go out and spend time in an industry conference, but we feel like it's important that they can take their relevant experiences inside the office and compare them to, you know, what other organizations and other folks are doing in the world. Uh, and so that's really how we, uh, you know, try to bring our, bring our folks up to the organization. We also, like I said, we try to lead through the, the lens of uh, lean leadership and, you know, while we're involved in driving direction of the organization, in some cases, you know, solutioning maybe more than we should be sometimes. Uh, you know, we really do try to uh, bring people along for the ride and really leverage the hearts and minds of our folks to drive innovation inside the organization, which I think drives a, uh, a level of compassion and ownership. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, and my boss says this, and he's coined a, a great, uh, you know, phrase from it, but... Um, our goals as leaders is to win the discretionary efforts of our people. And if we can do that, we are, we are being, we're excellent leaders. If we cannot win the discretionary efforts of our people, we will fail. Terrific. What a, a great message to, to, to conclude on. So um, thank you for your time and perspective to today, Donovan. Uh, we're going to be concluding our session this afternoon on just a few final items. Uh, first, we'd like to invite our audience to join us for one of our upcoming webinars. And if we're going to move to this uh, that final slide there, please. Um, we've got several intriguing sessions coming up focused on reverse logistics, uh, lip service leadership, one of my favorites, uh, gender pay gap IQ, and much, much more. So check all that out at apixatlanta.org. Secondly, if you're in the state of Georgia and you want to engage the next generation of students, we'd welcome you to join us for our Supply Chain 101 initiative, where we're taking teams of volunteers in the elementary schools to talk supply chain with third, fourth, and fifth graders. Contact us for more information. Finally, don't miss our upcoming workshop in Atlanta with Bo Groover of the Effective Syndicate as he uh, trains us on lead the people and manage the process on June 15th. Of course, feel free to reach out to me if there's anything else we can do to serve as a resource for you and your organization. You can reach me at evp at apixatlanta.org. Hey, Donovan, before we conclude today's session, any final thoughts on your end? Um, I'd just say a life outdoors is a life well lived. So uh, make the time to go experience a great outdoors. Yeah, you'll never regret it. So thank you very much for the time today. I, uh, I appreciate everybody who joined in and listened. I, I'm open for questions. If you want to connect to me through LinkedIn, feel free to do that as well. Perfect. Perfect. As we wrap up today, we'd like to give a big thanks to our guest speaker, Donovan True with REI for this presentation and his insight. We'd also like to thank our sponsors again, Apex Atlanta and Talent Stream. Of course, a big thank you to our audience for participating on behalf of Supply Chain Now Radio. This is Scott Luton concluding today's episode. Have a wonderful week and we hope to reconnect with you again real soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Bye-bye. Yes, sir.